disclosure, particularly on, on Alan's deal, I serve on the board of HFA and I'm vice chair of the agency, and we approved uh, your deal. Uh, and uh, one thing I want to point out is that you know the the construction loan, the construction bonds are 17 uh, and a half million dollars. The permanent uh, amount of those bonds gets reduced down to 2.3 million dollars. And effectively, what happens is there is a redemption of those bonds, and, and effectively the amount of permanent debt through the bonds that can be afforded is, is, is really only the amount that can be afforded, and that's $2.3 million. So the question is what happens to those bonds? And that's something that's very important to HFA, it's very important to HDC, because those bonds become recycled bonds, and we're able to couple those with the tax-exempt bonds that are required to the 50% test, which for those of you that haven't done uh, bond transactions, those are bonds that are subject to the state's volume cap, and it's a very precious resource. So, you know, when we're doing transactions, um, you know, both HDC and HFA only want to allocate an amount of taxes and bonds that's absolutely necessary, and it may be that additional bonds are required to make the financing work of that to occur through these recycled bonds. They don't get tax credits, but they are tax exempt bonds. Uh, and that's an important point. So in order to do the deal that, that Alan did um, to afford the uh, permanent side of the bonds, we had to redeem a large chunk of those bonds. And then the balance of those can be used in the future projects. I just wanted to point that out. I don't know if that came up in terms of your uh, approval or your financing, but. Yeah. Well, one thing interesting about that is though, as we may move toward models where there's middle income housing, you know, up above 60% AMI. So maybe in those deals they'll have tax exempt bonds, you know, new issues for 60% and under, and then recycled bonds for the over 60% of AMI units. Uh, and that right. we may start seeing, if we're going to really do this mm -hmm. spread of income bands, we may start seeing that. Right. Um, so the, the two projects that were presented are actually quite similar, both in size and, and location. And uh, I'm familiar with another MRT deal, it was a potential MRT deal in the Bronx that unfortunately suffered some political tragedy, I guess I would say, and, <laughs> and, and isn't going forward. And you know, without naming names, I just am curious about both of your experiences in getting the deal approved, both you know at the local level, you know, the state politics, the you know, the local politics, how did, how did that go? Can you speak a little bit about what it was that you had to do to get, to get your deals approved? I guess for us, you know, both projects, the Leninger and Arthur Avenue are located in uh, Bronx Community Board 6. Um, and um, the key for us was um, very early on establishing a strong, direct relationship with the uh, district chair and the district manager. And we were fortunate because the former vice chair of um, CB6 was one of the early proponents and developers of support housing, a woman named Sister Barbara Leninger, ergo the name Leninger Residences. Um, and, and our executive director and I had an existing and long-standing relationship with her. So she was able to provide um, entree um, to the leadership of the board very early on in the process. And um, we were able to um, convince them that um, we were gonna bring something to their community that was both you know, something that would meet our objectives organizationally, but would provide a resource to the community. And we put an emphasis on providing, even on the homeless units, targeting people who had roots in that local community um, and then for the low-income units, really giving priority to people who had roots in that local community. And by bringing in family units and not trying to cite a strictly singles project, which I don't think would have received the same kind of support from the, uh, the local community. Um, that, that, again, it met our objective, but it also met the, the local community's objective. And then once the, pro the, the building became operational and you know, they were able to see that two vacant lots that have been a blight on the community for you know several decades were now vibrant um, housing locations and and you know vibrant parts of the community um, and literally two blocks away from the community board's office um, we not only 
um, had a positive relationship, we were, we were viewed as an asset in the community. And so when it came time to cite the next project, we had that track record. And um, our ability to be able to deliver on the commitments that we made to the community early on went a long way when we went back and said we want to do the next one. Yeah, our, our experience was a little different. Um, I, I, I had the advantage of being first uh, of a long line of projects that were lining up on Webster Avenue. Thank goodness I was first because I sort of got through, not with an approval, but not with an objection either, which was, which, which was, was good enough. Um, but I, and I, I didn't, hadn't, hadn't quite appreciated actually, just in terms of my own due diligence, I should have realized, did a little exploration, but I, they had just finished rezoning Webster Avenue from almost all the way from the hub all the way up to Gun Hill Road, and the community had a whole set of expectations that had been um, uh, a part of that rezoning that we could not fulfill because even the zoning that was on our site didn't allow it. We, they wanted parking, we, and I was I had rock three feet below the surface. I couldn't put parking, and they wanted retail, and I don't have zoning for retail. And um, but that's what they wanted, uh, or they wanted middle income housing. They didn't want affordable housing. So um, I could not satisfy them on any of those things, but fortunately we were very early in the game. Uh, I think some of our uh, colleagues have had a harder time after us with uh, that board. Uh, but, but one thing I would, would say, now that, since this is like fresh to me, this whole industry, so what I'm getting back a lot of from people that are sympathetic but are fighting a political problem is the more we can say that we are going to deal with local people I think it would go a long, long way to um, mollifying some elements of opposition. In other words, you know, in the standard affordable housing deal, you know, we, we're only allowed to say 50% preference for community board. But for supportive, if we can say we're going to, you know, really target and draw from, you know, as much as possible your community board, but certainly this borough, um, it'll, it'll, I think it'll help a lot. And if, and if we can get the data from the powers that be, if they can know where somebody used to live, and now maybe they're homeless, but they used to live in that, in that community board. I think, I think that would go a long way to softening because there's a perception out there that all these people are being thrown from Manhattan up to the Bronx. I mean, that's, that's what you get over and over and over again. Um, so if we can say we're, we're local, I'm, there'll still be people that oppose, but I think it'll, it'll soften the blow a lot. Yeah, I think that's, the, uh, that's an important point. And, and the state senator that is located in the area was saying, you know, well, what's with all the, you know, the support of housing in the Bronx? And, you know, maybe we should spread this around a little bit, which I think um, th there has been a perception of that. In fact, you know, obviously, support housing and crews and all, all fine boroughs. But, um, you know, that, that I think was what created uh, a strong objection to other projects uh, going forward. And, and I know the one project that we're, uh, that we're working on is now just going to be a senior housing project, which is, I mean, to me, very unfortunate because the MRT money will not be used. Um, well, one of the th projects that we're working on right now in pre-development is actually located in the same community board as Alan's project. And we're, we're feeling the after effects of his and the other projects that were developed on Webster Avenue because the community now um, is much more savvy, much more attuned to what's going on, and much more um, vocal about what it is that they want and don't want. And so when I talked about before being flexible, part of it is being flexible in terms of your model. We're looking to site a building there that would have a lower percentage of homeless, would have a moderate income band built into the building, and it's in part because it's a, it's a model that we're interested in doing, but it's also in part in response to what the community has expressed as their interest in that particular neighborhood. 